All right, salam alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Fazid bin Sayed. And today we'll be dis discussing about the fatty acid and the triglyceride synthesis. So this lecture was given by Dr. Abdul Jabbar to you guys. Um, so just to quickly, uh, like, uh, quickly give you a brief idea about what we are going to discuss in this lecture. Uh, is mainly uh, talking about the fatty acid and how they are. So first we'll talk about the different fatty acids. Um, how do we classify them based on their number of carbons and the double bonds? Uh, what do we mean by essential and the non-essential fatty acids? And um, then we are gonna discuss about the derivatives of these fatty acids, the important derivatives like the eucosinoids. And then the, the bulk of the lecture is going to be talking about how do we synthesize fatty acids. So what are the different steps? What are the different enzymes um, that we are gonna use to make fatty acid in the, uh, in the cells? So let's begin our talk. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, put it in the chat box and uh, I can answer them. All right, so let's begin inshallah. So fatty acid, what do we mean by fatty acids? How do they look like? So fatty acids are usually like a long chain of carbons uh, they, that are linked together. So if whenever we see a fatty acid, how they are named, they are named uh, as uh, the example which is given here. So we have number 16, this is the number of carbons and then the zero here indicates the number of double bonds. Now, if we have a double bond, like instead of zero, if we have one or two, then in the bracket, you will see the position the, at which the double bond is taking place. So suppose if it's one, in the brackets, you will see uh, six or nine or something like that, which will indicate where the double bond is being placed. As soon as there is a double bond, now it is considered as a uh, as an unsaturated fatty acids, because if it's all single bonds, it is your saturated fatty acids. So this is one example. We have palmitic acid. The, it has 16 carbons, 16 carbons written here. There is zero, so no double bonds. So if you don't have any double bond, you don't have to indicate obviously in the brackets. And if there are no double bonds, that means it is a saturated fatty acid. <clears throat> Let's move on to dis discuss more uh, examples of fatty acids. So we have here, we have the stearic acid. This is 18, zero. Again, 18 indicating the number of carbons, zero indicating the number of double bonds. So there are no double bonds here. Oleic acid. Oleic acid is 18, one. So 18 is the number of carbons here, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 18, and one indicating the number of double bonds. So if you see here, we have one double bond in the center. And this is at the carbon number nine. So if you see, if you count, it is at the carbon number nine. As soon as you have a double bond uh, or it, it becomes uh, an unsaturated, the fatty acids are usually not straight. They are usually kinked. Then we have the other example, which is linoleic acid. This is uh, indicated by the number 18, two. So 18, again, is the number of carbons, two indicating there are two double bonds. So we see here, we have one double bond here, one double bond here. What is the position of double bond? It's at nine and 12. So it is at position number nine and 12. Uh, then we have the linolenic, linolenic acid. This is your 18 and three, 18, three. So 18 is the number of carbons and three is the number of double bonds. So we have one double bond here, one double bond here, one double bond here. Then uh, what is the position? It's at position number nine, position number 12, position number 15. So if you count from here, one, two, three, blah, 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 you will reach uh, one double bond at nine, the double bond at 12, and the third double bond at 15, carbon number 15. So this is how you count it. Uh, so now we'll move on to discuss about the difference between the essential fatty acids and the non-essential fatty acids. So essential fatty acids means our body is not able to synthesize these fatty acids. Now this is the same as essential amino acids. Same concept. Essential means we are not able to synthesize it, so we have to take it in our diet. So similar concept here. So essential fatty acids, that means our body is not able to synthesize it, so we have to take it in our diet. So body synthesizes most fatty acid it requires, except two, which is linoleic and linolenic acid. So that means we have to take this in our diet. 
Vertebrates lack the enzyme to introduce the double bonds at position number uh, omega-3 and omega-6. So if you see here, the omega carbon is counting from your methyl group. So this is one, two, three. So it's here. One, two, three. So this is one, two, three. This is omega-3. One, two, three, four, five, six, omega-6. So this is uh, your position of double bond uh, from your omega carbon. These fatty acids must be consumed through our diet because these are your essential fatty acids. So linoleic and linolenic acid used by body for synthesis of other omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. So what do we do when we eat uh, these fatty acids in our diet? Our body will use these um, fatty acids as the precursors to make other fatty acids from them, other derivatives from them. And one example is arachidonic acid. So this is an omega-6 fatty acid precursor for prostaglandins. Uh, there are other derivatives of arachidonic acid like prostaglandins, leukotrienes, prostacyclins, and so on. We'll list this in the uh, coming slide. Deficiencies will lead to retarded growth and different skin lesions. So how do we count? Again, as I mentioned before, the double bonds related to carbon at the methyl terminal end, the omega carbon. So the methyl end is your omega carbon, and then you can count from here. One, two, three for omega-3. One, two, three, four, five, six for omega-6 fatty acid. So these are your uh, essential fatty acids. So then now we'll discuss about the derivatives coming from these essential fatty acids. And one of the most important one are your eucrisinoids. So eucrisinoids are basically here, these ones. So we have the prostaglandins, prostacyclins, um, uh, different prostaglandins again, and the thromboxane. So these are your pros the uh, eucrisinoids. And also we have the leukotrides. Actually, to explain this graph, I have added this one from the first aid. This explains much better how we go from the membrane lipids. So we have the membrane lipids, from, uh, which is present in the cell membrane, okay? We have one enzyme known as phospholipase A2. This phospholipase A2 will break down the phospholipids into arachidonic acid. Now, this arachidonic acid is your precursor. So now we have two pathways, either the lipooxygenase pathway, which is here, lipooxygenase pathway, which will make your leukotrienes, or we have the cyclooxygenase pathway, which will form your prostacyclins, prostaglandins, and thromboxane. Okay, so this is just to give you a good idea because this uh, figure explains it better. So from the arachidonic acid, we go either to the leukotrienes from lipooxygenase, or we go to prostacyclin, prostaglandin, and thromboxane with the help of cyclooxygenase. Let's go back to this diagram. So we have the phospholipids, the same phospholipids that I discussed. With the help of phospholipase A2, it is converted to arachidonic acid. From the arachidonic acid, now it has two pathways, either the prostate. Uh, glandin pathway with the help of cyclooxygenase or the leukotrienes pathway with the help of lipooxygenase. Now, what are the different functions of these lipooxygenase or the uh, leukotrienes? So the function of leukotrienes is basically a bronchoconstrictor. So you can think that it has uh, a role in uh, asthmatic patients because it is a potent bronchoconstrictor. Uh, it's a chemoattractant for inflammation. So it attracts different molecules different uh, white blood cells. Uh, if we take the functions, different functions of your, uh, uh, in the cyclooxygenase pathway, we have the prostacyclin, we have the prostaglandins, and we have the thromboxane. So prostacyclin, the function of prostacyclin, what I think of it is that it is a good thing. It is a good molecule. Prostacyclins are good because they are basically dilators. They inhibit the platelet aggregation and so on. On the other hand, uh, we have the thromboxanes. Thromboxanes are the bad ones. This is how I think of it. So they are vasoconstrictors, they are uh, platelet aggregators, they are potent hypertensive agent, and so on. So they are the bad ones. This is how we memorize thromboxanes. And here we have prostacyclines, which are the good ones, which is dilators for platelet aggregation. Then in the center, we have the prostaglandins. Prostaglandins have a wide range of functions. So they are important for inflammation, they are important for pain, fever, they are vasodilators, they are vasoconstrictors, depending on which one are we talking about, because there are different uh, classes of prostaglandins. Um, they can inhibit platelet aggregation, they can induce birds. So again, they have a wide rule of functions. Uh, if, if you just talk about prostaglandins, depending on which prostaglandin we are talking about, uh, they have their own uh, different functions. 
So arachidonate, a 20 carbon fatty acid with four double bonds is derivative of a linolenate. So we are talking about this one. The arachidonate is coming from linoleic acid. It is a precursor for signal molecules, uh, 20 carbons long called as eucosinoids. These molecules are paracrines because they are short-lived and only affect the nearby cells. So uh, paracrines means they only affect the nearby structures and they are short-lived, so they, uh, they have a short half-life. I hope uh, this part is clear. Uh, moving on, uh, this we discussed. Now, quickly talking about what do we mean by the tricyclicerols, because the fatty acid, when we synthesize fatty acids, the fatty acids are basically a component of your triacylglycerols. So triacylglycerol is the form which is stored in the adipose tissue. So uh, let's quickly discuss what do we mean by triacylglycerols when we talk about the storage form of uh, fatty acids. So the triacylglycerol, as the name suggests, it is tri, so three, something is three. So we have three fatty acids and a glycerol. So it has a glycerol backbone. So it's basically one glycerol. So this is your glycerol backbone to which we have three fatty acids attached. So this is your triacyl glycerols. This is the storage form, which is stored in your adipose tissues. Uh, where do we get the fatty acids for triacyl glycerol synthesis? We have either the diet coming from what we eat, breakdown of triacyl glycerols, uh, in the chylomicrons, because chylomicron is the, uh, the light protein which transport the fat in, from the intestine to, to the tissues. And the de novo synthesis of fatty acids, we make fatty acids in the liver. So these are the two major mechanisms, how we get the triacid glycerols. All right, so it's good. Now we jump into the fatty acid synthesis. <clears throat> I changed the order of the slides. Uh, I think this one at the next slide was uh, present later on, but I shifted here because I felt like it, this place is much more relevant for it. So if you just focus with me, uh, you will understand uh, what makes us shift our metabolism towards fatty acid synthesis. So just imagine with me, we um, eat our food, Okay, so we are now in a well-fed state. We have a lot of glucose in our body, which is present. It goes into the cell. Inside the cell, the glucose is undergoing glycolysis. And after glycolysis, so um, it goes into the TCA cycle. And, and after TCA cycle, we have the intermediates like NADH, uh, which goes to the electron transport chain. And there, it generates ATP, right? And this should be clear by now from your mole one. Now, just think that we have a lot of energy now inside the cell. We have a lot of ATP. We don't need this much of ATP. So what do we do? We don't need any more ATP. So we don't need the TCA cycle to be continuously running uh, because we don't have to make the NADH that is the precursor for TCA, the electron transport chain. So we need to shut down the TCA cycle. So how do we shut this down? We shut down the two major enzymes here. Okay, so if we have a lot of ATP here, or if we have a lot of NADH, which is the, uh, the high energy molecule, if we have a lot of this, we don't need to make any more ATP, so we have to shut the TCA cycle. So both ATP and NADH, what it does is that it inhibits these two enzymes, the isocitrate dehydrogenase and the alpha ketoglutrate dehydrogenase, which are part of your uh, citric acid cycle. Once you inhibit these two enzymes, what will happen? All the precursor will start to accumulate. So we have the accumulation of isocitrate. We have the accumulation of citrate. What do we do with these two compounds? Because this is accumulating, we need to shift these two molecules to some other pathway to make a better use of it. So what we do is that we shift these molecules, like the citrate, now this is present inside the mitochondria. We shift it outside. We shift it to the cytoplasm. Inside the cytoplasm, we um, put the citrate in a reaction, in a pathway to generate something which is more useful to us, which is known as the fats or the fatty acids. So we shift the citrate to make fatty acids and then ultimately your fats so that we can store these fats in the adipose tissue and in terms of starvation we can break this fat down 
and then we can make energy out of these fats. So this is the whole concept behind your fatty acid synthesis. Once your glycolysis is done, once your TCA cycle is done, when your electron transport chain is done, we have a lot of energy, we don't need any more energy. So we shift the citrate, we, we shift the intermediates of your TCA cycle towards something more useful, which is your fatty acid synthesis. And we make the fatty acids out of it we make the triacylglycerol out of it, and then we store them in your adipose tissue. When in terms of starvation, in terms of hunger, we break it down and then we use the fatty acids for energy later on. So this is the whole idea behind it. So this is the, the slide explaining that. Uh, this slide again explains the same thing. Okay, so uh, we stop here. If we go, if we can, if I can just go back to this slide. So we stop here. So the citrate. So what we are doing with the citrate is that we are shifting the citrate out into the cytoplasm from mitochondria, shifting it out into the cytoplasm. So this is your citrate. We are pushing it out inside uh, uh, your cytoplasm. Now citrate, as I told before, we need to shift it to make fatty acids. So we break the citrate down. So if you see here, if I just go back, citrate was actually a product of acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate, right? So when we break down citrate, we will make acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate back. So I'm just breaking down. I'm just breaking down the citrate into acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate back. What I am using for fatty acid synthesis is the acetyl-CoA. So this is your main precursor for your fatty acid synthesis, the acetyl-CoA. Uh, apart from acetyl-CoA, I need some help from other molecules. The help come mainly from your NADPH and it comes from ATP. So these two molecules are helping me to make fatty acid because it is synthesis part. So I'm building something. So I need energy from somewhere so that I can build it. So I'm taking scratch molecules, small molecules, building it into a large molecule. So now I need energy. I, I get this energy mainly from ATP and NADPH. Now, if you go in more details, where do we get the NADPH from? We mainly get the NADPH from your pentose phosphate pathway. And the other one is your conversion of malate to pyruvate. We make some NADPH and this NADPH is used in your fatty acid synthesis pathway. So again, citrate is sh shifted outside. Citrate is broken down, acetyl-CoA, oxaloacetate. Acetyl-CoA is your precursor for fatty acid synthesis. You get the energy from NADPH and ATP. Now, there are um, uh, just a good mnemonic for you to remember in a long run is that uh, remember three words, okay? They all sound like C. So uh, synthesis or fatty acid synthesis, so S sound happens in the cytosol, again, the S sound, and the precursor is citrate, okay? So C, C, or S like the S sound. So fatty acid synthesis happens in the cytosol with the precursor of citrate because there is fatty acid oxidation, which is very easy to confuse. So oxidations happen in the mitochondria and it requires your carnitine. So there is carnitine, which is part of oxidation and citrate, which is part of synthesis. So again, citrate in the cytoplasm requires, uh, uh, sorry, fatty acid synthesis uh, happens in the cytoplasm and requires your citrate. I hope it's clear. So fatty acid synthesis happens where? This happens mainly in the liver, your mammary gland, and the adipose tissue to a lesser extent. So mainly for the, uh, the storage point. Now there are three steps that are required for fatty acid synthesis. The first stage we talked about, this is your fatty acid synthesis transfer of acetyl-CoA out of the mitochondria into the cytoplasm. Citrate is transported to the cytoplasm and split into oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA. This is the same thing that we just talked about. Oh, what regulates the oxidation? Uh, it's a complete different uh, lecture. Uh, it's in the next lecture, fatty acid oxidation. So what regulates? It's a very, um, um, I would say, a weight question because uh, do you mean like uh, what molecules or what hormones regulate it or what states regulate it? Uh, probably in the next lecture, you will uh, get to know more about the oxidation part, okay? So you can um, just wait for that part. Uh, okay, coming back, um, the fatty acid synthesis. So we said we have the three stages, right? The first stage, the second stage, 
and uh, third stage. So first stage, we just talked about the acetylcholine, the uh, citrate, which is being transported outside, split into oxaloacetate and the acetylcholine. This is your first stage. The second stage is the activation of acetyl-CoA to form melanyl-CoA. So what we do, it's uh, coming up in the next slide. So what we do is that we will uh, convert the acetyl-CoA to form melanyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is a two carbon, melanyl-CoA is a three carbon. And then we use this melanyl-CoA and the acetyl-CoA combinations to generate um, a long fatty acid, which is a C16, uh, I mean 16 carbon. Uh, just a second, I have a question. Could you please repeat the mnemonic you were referring to? Okay, so what I was referring to was that um, the three S or the S sounding stuff, okay? So if I just go back here, so it's all with the C or the S sounding, okay? So fatty acid synthesis, again, the S sounding happens in the cytosol. So if you see here, fatty acid synthesis happens in the cytosol, again, all the S or C sounding with a precursor of citrate, again, or the S or the C sounding, okay? So this is your synthesis part. In contrast, to fatty acid oxidation, which is the breakdown of fatty acid, this requires uh, your carnitine. So in the next lecture, you will discuss more about the fatty acid oxidation, uh, which is the breakdown of fatty acids. And one important uh, uh, intermediate of this is require the, uh, the requirement of carnitine. So uh, yes, it, it happens in the metrics. No, it happens. The carnitine is required uh, on the surface of the mitochondrial matrix, okay? So for the transport of your fatty acid from your cytoplasm to the mitochondria for the oxidation, uh, this requires your carnitine. With the help of uh, carnitine palmitate transferase, you transfer them inside and then it is being broken down, all right? Is that answer your question? Okay, perfect, so we can move on now. So I was at this step, this uh, slide. So I talked about the first stage, the second stage, and the third stage. So first stage, we shift the citrate out, break it down into, cyto in the, uh, into oxaloacetate acetyl-CoA. We use the acetyl-CoA to uh, convert into menyl-CoA, which is a three carbon. And then we use this combination of acetyl-CoA and the menyl-CoA to generate a long fatty acid, which is 16 carbons long. We'll discuss them in detail now. So this is the first stage, which is here. It's the first stage, referring in detail, okay? So citrate, which is synthesized in the mitochondria, is transported to the cytoplasm and cleaved by ATP citrate lyase to generate acetyl-CoA for fatty acid synthesis. The same thing we talked about in the previous slide. Same thing, exact same thing, right? So we take the citrate, shunt it outside, break it down the acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate. Then we use the acetyl-CoA for fatty acid synthesis. Fatty acid synthesis requires reducing power in the form of NADPH. It's the same thing just I talked about. So we need energy. We need to build something. So we need energy. This energy is coming from your NADPH. So some NADPH comes from the oxidation of oxaloacetate and some is coming from your, actually majority is coming from your uh, here. So some is coming from, from my malate to pyruvate, some NADPH and the other is coming from your HMB, uh, uh, HMB pathway or pentose phosphate pathway. Um, okay, so this is good. All right, again, the same thing, same thing, okay? So we have mitochondria over here, we have the cytoplasm over here. In the mitochondria, we said we have the citrate. The citrate is building up. So what we do, we shunt the citrate outside, inside the cytoplasm. In the cytosol and cytoplasm, we break the citrate down into oxaloacetate, into acetyl-CoA. We use the acetyl-CoA for fatty acid synthesis. What do we do with the oxaloacetate? We convert them into malate and pyruvate so that we can make some NADPH. And this NADPH is used for the energy for fatty acid synthesis. Then we shift the pyruvate back in so that we can make some more oxaloacetate so that we can make citrate and then the citrate is shunted outside. So same thing again. Fatty acid synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm requires acetyl-CoA 
any BPH, ATP, CO2. So these are the requirements. So these are your building blocks, okay? The first step requires the transfer of a stalk wave from mitochondria to the cytoplasm. Citrate serves as a carrier of two carbon fragments from mitochondria to cytosol for fatty acid biosynthesis. Same information, same content, just in different slides. So I think the past four uh, or three or four slides is just referring to the same concept. So if you just understand that, you should be good. Second stage of fatty acids. Okay, now we are moving to something else. So till now we discussed about how we reached till acetyl-CoA. Now we are moving from acetyl-CoA. So what we do, we use this enzyme, which is acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And this is like another mnemonic, if you want to remember, whenever you hear carboxylase, any enzyme, which is carboxylase, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, or there are other carboxylases. So whenever you hear carboxylase, you have to know this enzyme is an ABC enzyme. What do we mean by, what do I mean by ABC? Is that A, it requires ATP. B, it requires biotin. C, it requires CO2, okay? So any carboxylase is an ABC enzyme. ATP, biotin, and CO2. So if you just see here, this is your carboxylase, sunquay carboxylase. What are we using? We're using ATP, biotin, which is not mentioned here, and CO2, this is your ABC, okay? So it requires ABC to add one carbon. So any carboxylase means it will add one carbon to the compound. So what we're doing is we're taking acetyl-CoA, this is two carbons, one carbon here, one carbon here. We're converting into a three carbon molecules. One, two, three. Okay, uh, I have a question here. What is biotin? So biotin is actually a vitamin, okay? So we use this biotin for as a cofactor. So uh, in the coming slide, in the next slide, actually, you will know how the biotin is working as a cofactor in these reactions. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Okay, perfect. So can you repeat the ABC? Yes, sure. So we have ABC for any carboxylase, okay? ABC means your ATP, it requires ATP, it requires biotin, B for biotin, and C for your CO2, okay? So if you see here, it requires ATP, it requires, okay, let's go to the next slide so you will see here. So this is your carboxylase, okay? So this is your acetyl coa carboxylase. If you just see in the center, it says biotin carrier protein. So it requires biotin. Okay, so this is your second. So A for ATP, B for biotin, C for CO2. Any carboxylase you see, it requires the ABC. Okay, perfect, you're welcome. So this is the first part. So acetyl coa to menyl coa, two carbon to three carbon. Then what do we do? We take the acetyl coa and the menyl coa, we keep adding them till we reach a 16 carbon molecule. And this, is with the help of FAS or fatty acid synthase, okay? So fatty acid synthase catalyzes the palmitate synthesis from acetyl-CoA and multiple menyl coa until we reach a 16 carbon molecule. How do we do that? It's coming in the, uh, in the coming up slides, okay? So don't have to, you don't have to worry about it now. So just know from this slide is that you take acetyl-CoA, convert them into menyl coa from menyl coa and acetyl-CoA, you keep adding them up until you reach a 16 carbon molecule and this is your fatty acid. So this is your second step of fatty acid synthesis. I hope it's clear. So if you see here, the acetyl-CoA carboxylase is the regulated and the rate limiting step in fatty acid synthesis. Any enzyme which is regulated, any enzyme which is a rate limiting step is a favorite question. Uh, material, okay? So they love to ask these enzymes which are regulated and rate limiting steps. So know them perfectly. So this is your second stage. Where are we now? We, we are discussing about the acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So how about we dig in more detail, we, we zoom in here in this acetyl-CoA carboxylase and see how does it add, uh, uh, can you please explain? Okay, I have a question. Can you please explain what you mean by rate limiting step? Okay, so any enzyme which is a rate limiting step or a regulated step means it is, as the name suggests, regulated means it is regulated from an external molecule. Okay, so in the coming slides, you will see that the end product, so suppose this is your end product, what it does is that it will inhibit these enzymes. Okay. So it will negatively inhibit, 
or negative feedback. This is the same negative feedback. We call it negative feedback. So the end product will inhibit the initial enzymes. Why? Because we don't have to continuously make uh, the, the products. We have to stop at some point. Otherwise, we'll have excess of something. So this is your rate limiting step. That means the palmitate, in our case, this is your end product. It will come and it will inhibit this enzyme, the ACC. So that's why we call the ACC as a regulated step, regulated because it's being regulated by some molecules. And we'll, uh, in the coming few slides, we'll discuss about other molecules. Like we'll discuss about insulin, we'll discuss about uh, glucagon, how they regulate this acetylcholine carboxylase. So that's why it is a regulated step and it is a rate limiting step. Uh, that's, uh, that means that it is uh, rate limiting and regulating are the same. Um, regulating means it is being regulated by some other molecules like hormones, uh, end products, and all that stuff. It is being regulated. Rate limiting means the uh, you basically uh, determine the rate at which the the enzyme is functioning. Okay, so if we have uh, a lot of products it will inhibit this enzyme, it will decrease the rate at which the enzyme is functioning. Or we have inducers of the enzyme. So these molecules will induce the enzyme so that they function even faster, okay? Rate limiting step, the slowest, uh, not necessarily it's the slowest, but um, in general, you can say that uh, they take some time, okay? Uh, this is specifically uh, of importance when we talk about the glucose metabolism, okay? So for the metabolism of glucose, it has to undergo your uh, glycolysis um, uh, to ultimately uh, reach the pyruvate and so on. I'm just giving you an example, okay, about how the rate limiting step can be eliminated. So this is specifically in your glucose metabolism. So you take the glucose and triple glycolysis. We know that multiple steps in the glycolysis pathway are rate limited step. So uh, there is some trick to it, okay? So have you seen anyone like uh, going for uh, gym or any activities and they eat uh, fruits or banana so that they get instant energy. Like probably you have seen some uh, athletes, okay? So they eat banana in the, uh, in the meantime, they have free time. This is because they are trying to skip these rate limiting steps in the glycolysis pathway. So what, we're, what they're doing is that they are skipping the glucose part. They are taking in fructose directly with the help of these fruits. So when you take fructose, the fructose will also eventually undergo uh, into the glycolysis pathway, but it has different steps and it will uh, eliminate these rate limiting steps, okay? So it will eliminate the rate limiting steps so that you will get instant energy or it will be faster, okay? So I am not sure if the rate limiting step is the slowest, but in general, it takes time. Okay. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Okay, I guess I can move on. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we were at this part, which is the second stage of fatty acids. So, okay, so I was here. So how about we dig in uh, and zoom in on this part, the acetylcholine carboxylase, okay? So let's zoom in, let's see how this enzyme functions. So this is your acetylcholine carboxylase. It has three parts. It has a transcarboxylase part, it has a biotin carrier part, and it has a biotin carboxylase part, okay? So three parts. And we said the function of acetylcholine carboxylase is to add a carbon to acetyl-CoA to form melanyl-CoA, right? So this is our reaction, the whole reaction, taking acetyl-CoA uh, to make your melanyl-CoA. So if you see here, you see the melanyl-CoA over here, right? This is your melanyl-CoA. So this is our final product. But wait, where are we getting the acetyl-CoA from? Where are we getting the CO2 from? Let's discuss in more detail. So let's take this enzyme, this the first part over here, okay? So the biotin carboxylase activates the CO2 and attaches it to the nitrogen in the biotin ring. So you see here, this is your CO2 molecule, which is highlighted in green. It is being uh, bound to this nitrogen molecule in your biotin, okay? 
Okay, so we have some idea. Where are we getting the carbon uh, to add to acetyl-CoA? It's coming from CO2. So we are adding the CO2 to this nitrogen phase. The next step is that the long flexible biotin arm carries the activated CO2 from the biotin carboxylase to the transcarboxylase. So from biotin carboxylase to the transcarboxylase. Remember, this is this, this is one whole enzyme, which is acetyl-CoA carboxylase one whole enzyme. It has three different parts, okay? Biotin carboxylase, transcarboxylase, and the biotin carboprotein. So the first, uh, so first part was addition of CO2. The second part is the transfer of the CO2 molecule from biotin carboxylase to the transcarboxylase. The third part, which is done by your transcarboxylase, is the addition of this CO2 molecule to an acetyl-CoA molecule. Once you add this carbon to these two carbons, you change the acetyl CoA into a melanin CoA. So this is your melanin CoA over here. So this is the function of your um, acetyl CoA carboxylase. Let's move on. Okay, again. Now we are so this was our second step, right? So we are done with the second step. Now let's move on to the third stage of fatty acid synthesis, which we said is carried out by fatty acid synthesis. What are we doing? We are taking acetyl CoA, taking the melanin CoA, mixing them in such a way and adding the carbons in such a way that we will end up with a, a 16 carbon molecule. Okay, so fatty acid synthesis consists of a series of condensation, reduction, dehydration, and reduction reactions. We'll see what do we mean by this. Fatty acid synthase is a complex of enzymes which catalyzes the formation of fatty acids. The fatty acid synthesis occurs on an acyl carrier protein or an ACP, which is a polypeptide linked to CoA. The intermediates are linked to the self hydryl group of CoA attached to ACP. All these texts, what it's trying to explain you is that we are converting the acetyl CoA into acetyl CAP. We are converting the melanin CoA into melanin CoAP. Uh, ACP. Why are we uh, doing this conversion? It's just for your fatty acid synthesis uh, so that fatty acid synthase can work uh, properly. So acyl translase and melanin translase attach the substrates to the ACP uh, so that now it is acetyl ACP and melanin ACP. So let's quickly discuss what is the function of fatty acid synthase. So it is a multifunctional dimeric enzyme. It catalyzes the stepwise synthesis of palmitate, which is your 16 carbon molecule. An ADPH is required again for energy. Each cycle adds two carbons from melanin CoA uh, to the growing chain. Okay, all good. So this is what happens. Okay, actually, let's go on to uh, this one. Yeah, this is better. And then we'll go back to the slide. So let's see here. This is your fatty acid synthase over here. The yellow highlighted is your acetyl CoA. How do we know? Because it is two carbon. Here we have a three carbon. So we know this is melanin CoA. One step, what do we do? We add two carbons onto a cell CoA, okay? What happens to the third carbon? It is uh, removed as CO2, okay? So this is how the third carbon is out. Now it's four carbon. Next step, what do we do? We take melanin CoA, add two carbons, add two carbons, add two carbons, add two carbons, until we reach a 16 carbon molecule. What's happening at each step? There is removal of one carbon in the form of CO2. Because remember, this is two plus three. So two plus three will form five, but we don't want to make five. We need to make only four. So one CO2 is removed, one CO2 is removed, one CO2 is removed. Now, how the CO2 is removed, this is better explained in this slide. So this, uh, this slide explains the sequence of reactions that we talked about. So it is condensation, reduction, Elimination, uh, actually not elimination, the other word of it is, where is it? Uh, here, so conduction, uh, condensation, reduction, dehydration, and reduction, okay? So condensation, this is your first step. So what do we do? We take acetyl CoA or acetyl ACP in this case because we have attached an ACP and melanin ACP, okay? We take these two, we undergo the first reaction, which is the condensation reaction. What are we doing? We are basically adding these two molecules, removing one carbon as CO2. But we have a problem in this one. We have formed a double bond over here. We don't need a double bond. So what do we do is that we undergo second reaction, which is a reduction reaction. Whenever we undergo a reduction reaction, basically we reduce a double bond. 
So we removed the double bond. Now it is on the uh, alcohol molecule. There is no double bond over here. Uh, uh, where are we transferring the, uh, the double bond? It's mainly with the help of NADPH. So NADPH is getting converted to NADP plus. So the NADP molecule is getting oxidized so that the acetoacetyl ACP is getting reduced. So this is your reduced molecule. Now we have to remove some hydrogens and oxygen because it is in excess. So we undergo dehydration reaction. So we remove the H2O molecule. But as soon as we remove the H2 molecules, now we have a problem again. We have formed a double bond again. We don't need a double bond. So again, we undergo the same thing we did in second step, which is reduction. So we are reducing the, this molecule. And in return, we are oxidizing the NADPH to NADP+. Plus. Okay, so these are the steps. First step, condensation. Second step, reduction. Third step, dehydration. Fourth step, reduction again. And, and here, by this, we, add, we converted a two carbon molecule into a four carbon molecule. Next step, we take the same thing. We add two carbons until it reaches six uh, carbons, then eight, and so on. So these two slides explain the same thing that I have just talked about. Okay, so this was me, uh, the, the previous slides were mainly talking about the third step. So we are done with our, uh, uh, the palmitate, which is your 16 carbon molecule. What do we do with the 16 carbon molecules? We'll discuss probably uh, in slide 22. Okay, so after three slides, we will see what do we do with this palmitate? What are the different options that we have from here, from this 16 carbon molecules? Uh, but before going to that, there are three slides which are explaining the same thing, uh, the same uh, thing I talked about before, the regulation. So remember here we said acetyl coa carboxylase is regulated and the rate limiting step. So what do we mean by this regulated step is this one. So we have here acetyl coa carboxylase. If you can see here, there is a positive feedback, there's some negative feedback. There's a lot of thing going on here. This is mainly because this step is the most regulated step, okay? So again, the, the reaction is the same thing that we talked about before. We have the citrate converting to acetyl coa, converting to malonyl coa, converting to palmitate coa in the sequence of reactions. But here we will talk more about the regulation of fatty acid synthesis. This step is the highly regulated one. So. If by just common sense, you think about, we are talking about fatty acid synthesis. And when do we make fatty acids? When do we store fatty acid? Is it in the starvation state or is it in the well-fed state? Mainly, it is done by the men, uh, in the well-fed state, right? Because when you have eaten enough, you have enough of energy, now you need to convert it. So we know that in the well-fed state, uh, well state, we have a lot of insulin and we have low glucagon, right? So you can just think that the insulin will trigger the activation to store fatty acids, whereas the glucagon will inhibit these steps because the glucagon works opposite to insulin. So just by common sense, you can think that insulin will activate this reaction and glucagon will inhibit this reaction. Now, why does insulin does, uh, not, is not mentioned here? I don't know why it's not mentioned here, but it is mentioned over here, okay? So we'll come to that part over here. Um, not only glucagon, but glucagon has other partners. So glucagon has epinephrine, it has growth hormone, they are, they are working together. Whereas insulin is the lone wolf, the insulin works alone. So I hope the, the regulation is good now. You can just think by your common sense that insulin will be activator of this pathway because insulin is secreted in the well-fed state and we need to store fatty acid in the well-fed state the glucagon will work oppositely. So this is about your regulation step. One more thing that I mentioned before was the negative feedback by the products. So if we make a lot of palmitoyl coa, we have a lot of products, downstream products, we don't need to make more. So what it does is that it will come back and it will inhibit this enzyme again. So it will inhibit the acetyl coa carboxylate so that we don't make more of palmitoyl coa because we already have enough of it. So we don't need to make more of it. Uh, so this is mainly talking about the regulation. Uh, the other uh, short-term regulation also comes, actually the, the one we are mentioning here is also short-term like insulin and glucagon, but just they are uh, discussing in a different slide. 
uh, again, if you just think the insulin will activate and glucagon will inhibit. How it activates, you have to know this because this is very confusing. Some enzymes are activated when they are phosphorylated, whereas some enzymes are activated when they are dephosphorylated. So it's very important you differentiate these enzymes. And remember which one is activated when phosphorylated and which one is inhibited when phosphorylated, okay? Let's take the example of acetylcholine carboxylase. In the high energy state, there is release of insulin and the acetylcholine carboxylase is activated when it is dephosphorylated. So if you see a phosphate over here, we don't see a phosphate over here. That means it is active when it is dephosphorylated. So just by common sense, you can think that, okay, acetylcholine carboxylase is activated when it is dephosphorylated. And we know that insulin is secreted in the well-fed state. So insulin should activate phosphatases and not kinases because we need to remove the phosphate from acetyl-CoA carboxylase to make it more active. So the insulin will activate the phosphatases and phosphatase means it will remove the phosphate. As soon as you remove the phosphate, the acetyl-CoA carboxylase will become active. So this is for insulin. On the other hand, we have glucagon and we know the glucagon will inhibit, right? It will inhibit this step. How does it inhibit? We know that the phosphorylated acetylcholine carboxylase is the inactive. So it will somehow try to phosphorylate this acetylcholine carboxylase to make it inactive. And this is done with the help of protein kinase, CMP dependent protein kinase A. So it will phosphorylate the acetylcholine carboxylase to make it inactive. So this is for your glucagon release. Uh, similarly, with a similar mechanism, we have uh, energy dependent like depletion of ATP or increasing AMP will activate the AMP kinases to cause phosphorylation of ACC to make it inactive. Okay, again, because depletion of ATP means low energy state and increasing AMP again means low energy state. And if we have low energy, we don't want to make all your acetyl-CoA go into fatty acid synthesis. We need to make more ATP. So we want the, the, uh, the acetyl-CoA to undergo your, uh, like the um, citric acid cycle. We want it to undergo electron transport chain so that we make more ATP. So this is how it is regulated. Uh, we discussed this part, we said the ACC is found as a dimer and when it is phosphorylated, is, it is inactive. Uh, citrate in the cytosol causes elastic modifications in ACC, causing it to po uh, polymerize to increase the activity. This is an example of, of feed forward uh, activation. I think we did, it was mentioned here. So citrate can activate the acetylcholine carboxylase. So this is an example of feed forward. That means the precursors will activate the downstream enzymes so that it runs even faster so that we make more of the product. The end product of fatty acid synthesis, the launching fatty acids causes electric modification in the ACC polymer to return it to the less active dimer. So this is an example of a feedback inhibition. So a lot of product will inhibit this enzyme so that we don't uh, make a lot of the products. Uh, in long-term regulation, prolonged consumption of high calorie diet causes increasing ACC synthesis, increasing fatty acid synthesis makes sense because if you have a lot of calories, we have a lot of energy, we don't uh, need to keep your uh, citric acid cycle running. So we shift it towards making fatty acid synthesis and prolonged low calorie diet is the opposite. So prolonged low calorie diet decreases the ACC synthesis, decreasing the fatty acid synthesis. So this is just uh, talking about the regulation. Now let's jump back where we left here. So remember we left here the palmitate. So it's just hanging there. What do we do with this palmitate? Let's let's do something with it. Let's go further with it. Okay. Okay. I have the question. Could you please repeat the feed forward and feed back part? Okay. So feed forward means that the substrates in a reaction will activate a downstream enzyme, okay? So this is one example of feed forward. This is a substrate. This is like way early. So this is probably present in the mitochondria. And then when it's coming out, this is not even related to it. But what it's doing is that, is that it is activating a downstream enzyme. So it is activating a downstream enzyme. So this is an example of feed forward reaction, okay? Feed forward. Uh, feed or 
forward feedback. What is it called? Yeah, I think it's called feed forward. Whereas if you see this example, the palmitile CoA is inhibiting its precursor enzymes. So this is an example of negative feedback or uh, uh, negative regulator, okay? So it's inhibiting the precursor enzyme. If it's activating the downstream enzyme, it is feed forward, downstream, forward, activating. If it's inhibiting the precursor enzymes, which were before upstream, then it is your uh, negative feedback, okay? I hope that's clear. Okay, I think I can move on. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we left where we left here, right? So we need to do something with this palmitate. It's just hanging right here. Uh, the problem is that our body, uh, our body is not able to put the double bonds. So this is uh, a problem that arises. So fatty acid synthase cannot generate the fatty acids longer than C16 palmitate. So this is another problem. So it can go till 16 and then stops. It cannot make more. But we need the longer carbons so that we can make other derivatives from these carbons, right? Uh, we use, suppose, for example, we use the linoleate or, uh, and so on. But this is not in humans. This is just an example to make the arachidonic acid. So we need to extend it even further. So how do we extend it? This is done by... Uh, separate enzymes, which are in the endoplasmic reticulum. These enzymes, they extend the palmitate by adding two carbon units using melyl coa as a substrate. Again, the same melyl coa, they're using this melyl coa to add these carbons. Enzymes bound to the ER also introduce double bonds onto the saturated fatty acids. Now they are adding the, uh, the double bonds. So remember our previous steps, they were not able to form a double bond. They were not able to elongate after 16. But these enzymes, they are able to form the double bonds. They are able to uh, form the longer uh, fatty acids, longer chain uh, fatty acids. Mm. Mammals lack the enzymes that introduce double bonds beyond carbon light. So I, I guess in the, uh, just a bit, I said we are not able to add double bonds. That's wrong. I take it back. I was uh, trying to say that we are not able to form the double bonds beyond carbon number nine. So we can form till here, but beyond carbon number nine, we cannot do it. So that's why these fatty acids are essential fatty acids. We take them uh, from our diet. So therefore, linoleate and linolenate acids are essential fatty acids that must be obtained in the diet so that we use these fatty acids to make other derivatives like eucosinoids, arachidonate, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is basically elongating our palmated beyond our 16 carbon. Okay, so we have made our fatty acid. Okay, it's amazing. But is it in a storage form? We, can we just store the fatty acid as it is? We cannot. So what do we do is that we convert the fatty acid into the triacylglycerols. Remember the triacylglycerols we talked initially, like initial, like fourth or fifth slide, we said the triacylglycerol tri is the storage form. We take three fatty acids, we attach it onto the glycerol and then we store it. So it is the same thing. So what we do, we are taking uh, food, it's coming. So chylomicrons, for example, it's bringing all the fatty acids. It's going inside the adipose tissue or it is going in the liver. It is getting attached to over glycerol and then it is getting stored as your triacylglycerol. okay? Similarly in the liver, same mechanism, fatty acids attaching with the glycerol converting into triacylglycerols. Now, uh, this uh, diagram also explains the other part, which is not specifically relating to our fatty acid synthesis, but instead it is relating to fatty acid oxidation. This is when we need to break down the fatty acid. So we need to break down the fatty acid, the triacylglycerols is broken down into the fatty acids and glycerol, the fatty acids are released so that it is a fuel for the other tissues, the fatty acids. So this is mainly talking, the top part is mainly talking about the degradation part, okay? The down part is talking about the synthesis part. Uh, Trisoglycerol synthesized with the help of glycerol phosphate, fatty acid CoA. We have discussed this. Uh, okay, so let's talk about more about this one, the glycerol free phosphate. We we already talked about the fatty acids where we, we are getting the fatty acids, how we make it. But what about the glycerol free phosphate? Where do we get this from? So glycerol 
uh, synthesis is basically a truncated or a smaller version of gluconeogenics. Okay, so it's kind of similar steps, but we go till DHAP here. The pathway is essentially an abbreviated version of gluconeogenesis from pyruvate to DHAP, followed by conversion of DHAP to the glycerol 3 phosphate, which is used for the synthesis of triacylglycerol. So these steps are kind of similar to your gluconeogenesis. I don't know if you're taken yet or no, but these steps are similar. So we take the pyruvate, convert into oxalic acetate with the help of PEP carboxykinase, convert them into PEP. Multi-step, we make DHAP. From DHAP, we make the glycerol 3 phosphate. And this glycerol 3 phosphate is the one that is used for your triacyl glycerol synthesis. So it's kind of gluconeogenesis, but we are, yeah, it's kind of opposite of glycolysis, like that's right. Uh, but some steps are different. So it's not completely going back because the step, which is just before the pyruvate is um, just one way, it is uh, irreversible, okay? So we have to shunt the pyruvate to oxaloacetate, which is a part of your TCA cycle. From oxaloacetate, you will make PEP. So this is how you shunt the PEP uh, from pyruvate to PEP, because in glycolysis, it's very easy. You can go from PEP to pyruvate directly. But in uh, gluconeogenesis or glycerineogenesis, we have to bypass uh, this step because it's irreversible. So you go from pyruvate to oxaloacetate, which is a TCA cycle intermediate, and then from oxaloacetate to PEP with the help of PEP carboxykinase, and then you make DHAP. Now, if we were talking about gluconeogenesis, then we would go until we make glucose and then we release the glucose. But here we are just talking about gly glyceroneogenesis. So we stop at this step of uh, glycerol 3 phosphate, and then we use this glycerol 3 phosphate for, for your triacylglycerol synthesis. All right, this is good. One uh, specific drug which is used uh, to regulate this part, or it is um, used for um, altering the pathway or altering the reactions is uh, TZD, which is a, a diabetic drug, okay? TZD or the other name is glitazones. I can never pronounce this name fast, or I can never actually pronounce this name. So I just say get zones or TZDs. Um, what this drug does is that, okay, so what happens in um, type two diabetes or diabetes is that there is uh, insulin resistance. And how do we get insulin resistance in specifically in type two diabetes is that uh, the fat molecule will hinder the uh, the effect of insulin and um, it will hinder the effect of your glucose uptake. So we need to get rid of these fat molecules, okay? So how do we get rid of this fat molecules which is circulating is by the use of this drug, which is your TCDs. So what does this drug do? It that, uh, is that it will um, activate a receptor known as PPAR, okay? So which is here, it activates a nuclear receptor known as PPAR. Is it correct to state, uh, say that, say what again, sorry? I just have a question, so I'm just answering that. Can you just tell me, state? Oh, um, Pepsi K, Pepsi K is the, oh, TZD increases Pepsi K. Yeah, you can say that, yeah. Because, uh, but you will not find FCK directly written in the textbooks. Um, like if you open first aid, you will see that the TZDs, their mechanism of action is with the help of PPAR. So this is what, what's written in the first aid. Uh, so this is what they will target, okay? So they don't want you, know, they don't want you to know the FCK part, but they want you to know that it acts through the help of PPAR, okay? Perfect, so how it works is that it activates this nuclear receptor, which is your PPAR, peroxisome proliferate activated receptor. Now we have different subtypes of PPAR, alpha, gamma, uh, so on, I think here it's gamma or alpha, I'm confusing, but just know that's PPAR. And then this PPAR induces the activity of PepsiK. So PepsiK convert the pyruvate into uh, your, uh, 
PEP, which is if you just go back here, Pepsi K was here, right? So Pepsi K converts your pyruvate, uh, sorry, the oxaloacetate into PEP, and then the PEP will eventually form your glycerol triphosphate. So they are just fast forwarding all the reactions going from pyruvate to glycerol triphosphate directly. Uh, so this and uh, this PPAR is activating Pepsi K induces the activity of Pepsi-K. If you have a lot of Pepsi-K, you make a lot of glycerol 3-phosphate. So this glycerol 3-phosphate can bind with the fatty acid, which was hindering the insulin and causing insulin resistance. So that once it binds to these two, it can be stored as triacyl glycerol. So taking TZD fast forwards the entire reaction, um, it specifically works on Pepsi-K, but in general, you can just say that, okay, it, it fast forwards the entire reaction. Okay, because this is the, the, the this is the mechanism of action of the drug. Right? Where is that here? Oh, okay, perfect. Um, so TZD increases the rate of glycerinogenesis, increasing the resynthesis of triacylglycerols in adipose tissue and reducing the amount of free fatty acids in the blood. And this is specifically helpful in type two diabetes. I think I missed this part. This sentence over here, 20 type 2 diabetes, elevated free fatty acids in the blood, they interfere with the glucose utilization in the muscle and promote insulin resistance. So we need to get rid of this increase in free fatty acids. This is done by this drug so that we have a lot of glycerol triphosphate binding with the fatty acids so that it is stored as your triacyl glycerols. Okay, uh, I think this slide is just I don't know what this slide is, to be honest. I couldn't understand this, but I guess this is just summarizing the reaction, like fatty acid plus coenzyme A will make your fatty acid CoA um, with the help of acyl CoA synthetase. Uh, I have no idea what this slide is trying to explain. All right. Regulation of triacylglycerol synthesis by insulin. So we talked about this part. So we have the carbohydrates, glucose. Glucose will make your acetyl CoA. If you have a lot of uh, the precursors like ATP and so on, it will inhibit the TCS cycle. So it will go on to form your fatty acids and it will go on to form your uh, triacylglycerols. Similarly, for your proteins, amino acids can be converted and so on. But uh, and we said these steps are activated by insulin. So insulin will help promote uh, the fatty acid synthesis. But what happens in patients who do not have insulin, like in patients with uh, diabetes, so they lack insulin. So what happens is that this step is not functioning properly. So after this step, actually, it's this is not the only reason uh, because of the shunting of the acetyl-CoA to ketone bodies and having ketoacidosis. There are, uh, I believe, one or two other mechanisms as well. Uh, but here, they are just discussing about this part. So since they lack insulin, they cannot make the fatty acids. So what happens to the acetyl-CoA? It will be shunted here. So increased uh, in diabetic patients is your ketone body synthesis. So instead of making fats, it will go on to form your ketone bodies like acetoacetate, hydroxybutyrate, acetone, and so on. So this is one reason why it is uh, shifted towards your ketone body synthesis. The other reason why it is uh, shifted towards ketone body is that in uh, diabetic patients, they lack insulin. So they are not able to utilize their glucose, right? So what happens, the fat is broken down and the fat uh, which is broken down, is uh, shunted towards the liver, and the liver will use this fatty acid precursors to make ketone bodies and so that the cells, the brain, the peripheral tissues, they can at least use ketone bodies instead of glucose. So this is another uh, reason. What happens if we have a lot of ketone bodies? So I think in the other lecture, like the fatty acid oxidation, we will discuss about the ketone bodies, uh, the different ketone bodies. Uh, one specific ketone, uh, uh, the uh, substrate, not the substrate, actually the intermediate is your acetone, okay? Uh, actually one product, not the intermediate. So one of the product is acetone and acetone is a volatile uh, compound. So what happens is that this acetone will be breathed out and people in severe ketosis, they smell of acetone. So the condition is sometimes mistaken for drunkenness because of this increase in acetone, this has a fruity order. So let's read uh, this slide. So insulin stimulates the conversion of dietary carbohydrates and proteins to fat 
Individuals with diabetes mellitus, they lack insulin. So in uncontrolled disease, this results in diminished fatty acid synthesis and the acetylcholine arising from catabolism of carbohydrates and proteins is centered instead to ketone body production. And one of the ketone body uh, product is acetone and this acetone will give the, uh, the fruity odor. Uh, and this is the end of the lecture. At the end, I have added two questions for just for you to uh, the practice. So what we'll do is that if you have any questions until now, you can ask me. Uh, okay, perfect. So if you have any questions, you can ask me. Uh, if there are no questions, so I will wait for a minute and then I will proceed to uh, the questions and I will, uh, so these questions are collected by your exam committee, I believe. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll read the question, we'll pick the right answer and uh, give you the explanation behind uh, the right answer. So if you have any questions, you can ask me now before we proceed to the questions. Uh, one question, does insulin stimulate glyceronogenesis? Um, I don't think so, because insulin is mainly the, uh, it works in your glycolysis pathway, right? So to get rid of all the glucose, because insulin is secreted in the well fed state. So we need to distribute all the glucose. Uh, glyceronogenesis is the opposite reaction. So it is uh, making your uh, the TCA uh, intermediates or your pyruvate going back into your uh, into back into making the uh, glucose or glycerol phosphate. Okay. Uh, it's not mentioned anywhere about the insulin and the glycerogenesis. So I'm sure that, but I doubt if it has any influence of glycer on glycerol agents. Okay, any other question? All right, let's go to the questions now. All right, so why do we give TCD for type 2 diabetes? So as we discussed before, like TCD, it will increase your PEP kinase, okay? PepCK um, here over here. So PepCK will increase your glycerol 3 phosphate so that we can store the uh, fatty acids, which is causing insulin resistance. So that fatty acids, which is present in the blood, they cause insulin resistance. So to get rid of the fatty acids, uh, we give TZDs so that we have increased glycerol 3 phosphate. They can join with fatty acids and they can be stored for your triacylglycerol. Okay. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, you got it. So once we decrease the fatty acids, the insulin can work better. All right, so let's move on to this question. Uh, you can type in the chat your answers. Let's see who is the fastest, who is the most accurate one. Okay, I have three answers till now. Okay, majority are saying E or D. Okay, so should I wait more until more people reply? Oh, so I'll give the, I'll read the question and I will answer it. So a teenager concerned about his weight attempts to maintain a fat-free diet for a period of several weeks. Fat-free diet. 
that means is not taking fat from outside so once we are not taking fat from outside we are most likely going to be deficient in our essential fatty acids right the essential fatty acids is going to be affected because essential fatty acids we mainly take from our diet okay for a period of several weeks if his ability to synthesize various lipids are examined which of the following is most likely to be most efficient in his ability to synthesize so this patient is most likely going to be deficient in essential fatty acids and he said the linoleic or the linolenic acid they are important for synthesizing our eucosinoids right and eucosinoids one of the derivative of eucosinoids is your prostaglandin yes excellent so whoever said the amazing so prostaglandins not just prostaglandins but we have prostacyclin we have thromboxanes we have uh, leukotrienes all of these are derivatives okay uh, other ones you can still synthesize because uh, you can still make them next question mm -hmm. I never, yes All right. Perfect. I see a lot of ease. Nice, amazing. So yeah, you got it correct. So um, an individual by, with a biotinidase deficiency. So biotinidase is important so that you can uh, remove the biotin from the food that we take. So then the biotin will be reabsorbed. So if a patient is having deficiency in biotinidase, the biotin is not able to dissociate from the food, it's not able to get absorbed. So if a patient is having deficiency of biotin, we said the enzymes, all the carboxylase enzymes will be affected. And one of the carboxylase enzyme is your acetylcholine carboxylase. The function of acetylcholine carboxylase is to convert acetylcholine into melanocholine. So that's right. Uh, option E is the correct answer. With that, I would like to end my session. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. You're welcome, guys. Okay, I don't think we have any more questions. We can we can end our session then. Thank you so much for this.